So what about the American case? This is where they have their strongest argument, they think. Because in America, Africans were overwhelmed or outnumbered. Because unlike the Caribbean, where you could drop a majority of Africans into an island, whites were the majority here. Though in South Carolina and Mississippi, uh, we had large numbers and in South Carolina, larger numbers than whites. And the most successful slave rebellion, or at least the best planned slave rebellion in the history of enslavement, the Denmark Vesey Rebellion. It sent fear down the spines of whites. But the key point is that Africans in America faced a different situation. And that situation was one where Euro-Americans could carry out a full-scale attack on African culture, the likes of which Africans experienced nowhere else in the world. And so that is why a lot of people historians have concluded, and a lot of us have been given the false narrative, including from some of our own scholars that slavery destroyed African-American culture. And to, to do that, again, we'd have to go back to Fanon's point that according to him, slavery and colonialism destroyed the ontology or sense of humanity and the metaphysics or the deepest structure or deepest ideas in that culture, in African culture. So what is the case for that? The case for that is that it's dead wrong. As I said before, as long as the people live, their culture will continue to live. As we often say, you can take the African out of Africa, but you can't take Africa out of the African. Africa is deeply embedded in the African. We all talk about genetic memory. And we always use it to just refer to uh, the trauma that comes out of slavery, that we had this memory of that. But if genetic memory extends to slavery, then doesn't it extend 144,000 years back? Because that's when the first human beings came into being. They were African. And these human beings, the Twa, gave birth to humanity. They gave birth to civilization. They gave birth to the idea of one God who they did not see as a human being. So you have a deep structure. And so that structure is certainly genetic. But those, as I've mentioned this before, those who have gone to the other side talk about cellular memory, how God is embedded in our cells a memory of our past. And so we can always explain the inferiority complex by slavery. But how do you explain the sharing, the humanity, the kindness, the love? How do you explain that? Dr. Siri McDougall was talking about how that was very basic to the African American, and I would say African people in general's conception of manhood. It was nurturing, and particularly it was not just um, providing food and clothing and shelter, and now both men and women do that, but it was providing love, nurturing, kindness. That's the African-American's view of himself. And smart African-American women know that when they're looking for a man, that's the kind of man they look for, who's intelligent and everything else, but kind. That comes out of your genetic and cellular memory. Comes out of your history and your culture. So what's the case for the African in America? In, in, to understand the African-American response, we got to look at the African response. The Dogon, a people that I refer to often, the first people that I studied in African culture and African philosophy or in their philosophy, it's their spirit system. They are the master astrophysicists of the world. In some ways, their astrophysics is more advanced than ancient Kemet. 
and they refer to a time that physicists, astrophysicists call singularity. Now, you can't get any deeper than this. I mean, if you're going to talk about um, whether you kept or lost a sense of deep thought, you can't go any deeper than whether you kept the notion of happening before happening happened. That's the Kimite description. Before existence happening, before happening happened. That would be God before happening happened. You know what I mean? Africans have this big concern about origin. We always start with roots, the beginning. African ast astrophysics is ahead of Western astrophysics, especially because we go back to origin. The pyramids in ancient Kemet, many of them are set according to the star or the star cluster Orion. Why? That's the beginning of the stellar system in our solar system, in our cosmos. So we like to go back to beginnings. And why wouldn't we since we are the beginning? And so when we look at the Dogon, they talk about a state of existence before existence existed that astrophysicists call singularity. And physicists say this is a state where only a wrinkle existed in what is now the cosmos, only a wrinkle. That was all. Now, this state of singularity in physics and in astrophysics is a, the period before relativity, before time. Now, the Bambara, when they talk about God, who they call Mangala, they say God is infinite force outside of space and outside of time. Outside of space and outside of time. So if a people hold on to their metaphysics, that is to the fundamental first principles, the first principles of life, then if they pipe into this, they're not just tying into something, they're tying into the deepest part of it, the origin. And so what happens with Africans in enslavement in this country? But I know this was true throughout the Western Hemisphere as well. Observant African American historians and African historians will tell you this. And I'll tell you this because I have three subjects I master, African philosophy, African-American philosophy, African history, African-American history, black political movements, and then a lot of other philosophies, a lot of other histories. And so I know from study, I know this, that while Africans underwent this horrendous experience of enslavement in this country and in the Western hemisphere, None was worse than any other. They were all vicious. We just had the numbers against us. While we all went through that, and every effort was made to break our spirit, you ask, how did Africans survive this? Well, we're resilient. You could say that, you know what I mean? No matter how bad things are, we always believe because of the way our culture is set up that things will get better. That's a part of it. Part of the reason is, and I want you to really listen to this, while we went through hard times, 249 years of it here, part of that time, most enslaved Africans lived outside of time. I want you to hear that. What that means is they piped into God's realm and communicated with God. And they drew from the deepest principles of the cosmos. So in one slave narrative, it's a sister picking cotton. And in the middle of picking cotton, God visits her and tells her, this ain't going to happen forever. And she starts jumping up and down and shouting and 
continues to pick cotton. When she comes off the field, oh, Miss Ann says, what are you jumping about? And she told her. She had an experience. She didn't tell her what it was, but she had an experience. She got whipped for it. But she, she was out of time. She was in contact with God, and God was telling her, they ain't going to exist forever because God is out time, outside of time and outside of space. And God was right. The leaders on virtually every plantation in the United States were not preachers, contrary to popular opinion. Most blacks in enslavement rejected Christianity. Most. Very few took it on. Most of those were house slaves. Most Blacks saw as their leaders diviners who were African priests, who they went to to consult about their destiny. You might say, well, what's the destiny of a slave? Well, the destiny of a slave had to do with the question of when in the hell could we get out of here? How could we end this? But when the enslaved were asked in slave narratives, why did you go to these diviners? They all gave the same answer. And anytime you get the same answer from black people, you know they're putting the wool over your eyes. They all said, we went to the diviner so that we could find out if we were gonna get a whipping and then to avoid that whipping because the diviner is supposed to have spirit powers and get that off of you. But the reason they went to the diviner, they're not going to tell a white interview. And those are the ones that conducted these WPA work progress administration surveys done under Roosevelt during the Depression. So it was white people running around interviewing ex-slaves. They're not going to tell you. But the reason was they were consulting their destiny. When Frederick Douglass tried to make his first escape, the old wise man on his plantation, who was a diviner, told him, don't do it, Fred. The eagle is going to get you. Because he could prophesy the eagle was the United States. He could prophesy that he'd get caught. Fred went ahead and did it and got caught. But the next time, it was a different story. So the leader on virtually every plantation was the holder of the deepest metaphysics that African people have, the spirit system of Africa. As Du Bois said, they were the natural leaders of Black people. They were the healers of the sick, the comforter of the sorrowful, and the natural leaders of the masses. No rebellion in slavery except one operated without a spirit or metaphysical foundation, without God up, up in it. And none have really embraced the masses of our people to this day unless it had a spiritual component. So in enslavement, Africans would go to the furthest removed shack or they would go to a river. They would go to some hidden place and put their heads under a bucket. These places were called hush harbors and they would call on the spirit until the spirit possessed them until they were outside of time and they got a message. That's the same thing that happened in voodoo, except in this case, it wasn't a priest conducting the rite. It was everyday Black people conducting that rite. And so what we see is Blacks drew on these fundamental principles, Harriet Tubman, how did she pull off so many successful uh, moves into the South, bringing back enslaved Africans? How did she do that? Because it would be almost impossible to not get caught at some point. There were so many slave patrols and everything else because she had second sight. Du Bois called it. You know, she had that deep insight that would tell her, don't go this way. They're there. They're over here. But they're not here. You know. George Washington Carver, you hear me mention him a lot. 
A lot of people have put him down because that's all you ever heard in school. You didn't really hear about the real George Washington Carver. You didn't hear about the real George Washington Carver that talked to plants, that thought God's thoughts. You didn't hear about that George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was the greatest scientist in the world because he piped in to the fundamental truths of the cosmos because in his humility, he was able to think God's thoughts. The key thing to understand about the African in America, the African in the Caribbean, or wherever we were, is God was first. But it wasn't God coming from a book. It was God who was inside of each of us. It was drawing from that spirit that was within each of us. And so every rebellion had at his heart spirit. Nat Turner, he saw blood on the leaves. He saw messages and signs that told him he was supposed to lead a rebellion that was drawn on the deepest metaphysical principles. And he had the most successful of the slave rebellions. He killed them a whole lot of whites. <laughs> and what he did is he set an example because he was a member of the secret society called the Loyal League. And his example was his crucifixion or his murder by these whites after they caught him was in Jerusalem. And he was a nominal Christian. He was really a spirit man because his stuff came from within. And he said, and those of the Loyal League said, he was setting an example for us, an example of what would happen to whites if they didn't end this savage system called enslavement. He was set an example of black courage, black manhood, and black pride. So far from it, slavery did not uproot the deepest principles of African culture, the principles of origin. In fact, it drove us to even draw from them at a deeper level. But here's the deal with the enslaved African. The enslaved African did not believe that his suffering alone guaranteed him a place in heaven or guaranteed him freedom. The enslaved African knew that they could praise the Lord, but they would have to pass some kind of ammunition. They would have to do something to break the bonds of enslavement themselves. And yes, some of our people succumbed to this double consciousness. Some of them in their belief in God, believed that God permitted this enslavement. This was a part of God's plan for punishing us for the wrong that we had done. We hear some black people saying that today. We were put here by divine purpose, like hell. We were put here by John Hawkins. God didn't have nothing to do with it. He put us on the good ship, Jesus, but that wasn't Jesus bringing us here. It was John Hawkins and company and the Queen of England. You hear me? And if you're going to say that Blacks are being punished for the wrong we've done through enslavement, then why wouldn't whites be even more punished for the wrongs they've done? God is neutral in those affairs. If you're going to get a chance to get God on your side, you're going to have to do something to free yourself. So some of us bought into these mythologies, but most of, most of us knew better. So when we look at the free the mind system, the transformational system, we have to understand that it has a firm foundation. And that foundation is in the fundamental first principles of the cosmos and those rest with God.